Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Jewel, uh, and uh, happy New Year again to uh, everyone on this uh, uh, call. Uh, and um, so, uh, I should thank uh, the organizers for uh, for inviting me to uh, talk about this work, which is based on a paper that appeared about a month and a little bit more. Uh, it's uh, with Matthias Cabardiel and uh, our ICTS student Pranavesh uh, Moiti uh, and uh, Bob Knighton, who is Matthias' student at ETH uh, Zurich. So, um, uh, oops, let's see, yeah. Uh, so let me give a little broad uh, roadmap to the uh, talk. Um, so I'll give a little bit of an extended motivation and uh, uh, and explain where, uh, where I'm really coming uh, to from, uh, 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 coming to for this uh, uh, topic. Uh, and um, uh, I'll um, uh, uh, then we'll focus on a very specific context for which I'll need to give you some background on um, the so-called symmetric product CFTs and uh, the covering maps that will appear in that context. Um, then uh, I will focus on the uh, the work that we actually did in this uh, the 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 technical heart of the um, paper that I just mentioned, which uh, involves a certain calculation in a large end limit uh, uh, and, where, and which we, um, and a corresponding matrix model and its solution. And then I will uh, try to uh, explain what the meaning of this calculation is um, and in particular why it uh, naturally gives you a way to go from the Feynman diagrams of the corresponding CFT to a sort of a string theory modelized space. And uh, in particular, uh, what the answers, what that tells you about uh, the dual string theory. And uh, I'll close with some uh, outlook. Uh, so, Motivation, well, uh, so the, the main question, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, behind uh, this investigation and many of the works uh, before uh, is uh, how exactly do large and quantum field theories uh, reorganize themselves into theories of strings. And as we know from the, the famous insight of Maldacena that uh, uh, one way to view it from the underlying string theory point of view uh, is uh, that uh, the physics of D-brains has this remarkable open closed string duality uh, where, whereby, and this is some sort of a postmodern version of the Cheshire Cat uh, story, uh, that when you sort of sum over all the holes, uh, uh, the back reaction alters the background and converts it to a sort of a closed string theory. Um, and this is some, uh, this is of course, very difficult to see explicitly happening uh, at uh, in the uh, regime of large soft coupling lambda or equivalently G string times uh, the string coupling times uh, N, the number of D brains. Um, and because of this, of course, we know many examples, but we have not quite been able to delineate the scope of uh, uh, the gauge string duality that um, and that has been one of the very remarkable things uh, in our field for the last uh, 20 plus years. So, uh, so what I will sort of do in this uh, talk or what I have been essentially uh, focusing on um, uh, is on a different corner from where many of the talks on ADS CFT are, uh, where we uh, we will try to uh, shift the focus to the corner, which is this one, uh, where we understand the field theory, uh, because this is uh, this uh, the horizontal axis labels the Toft coupling, and uh, or equivalently in terms of the uh, radius of ADS in string units. So uh, this is. Uh, weak 
soft coupling where perturbative quantum field theory uh, applied to the large and quantum um, uh, system applies. Uh, and uh, this is the opposite limit, uh, which is where one normally studies the, um, uh, the ADS-CFT correspondence where you, a lot of the work has been on the weakly um, curved gravitational side. Uh, of course, there is also the parameters, the string coupling or one over n equivalently. Uh, and we will mostly can focus on the case where uh, that is uh, G string is almost zero or N is essentially infinite. So, so this is the regime. This is of course, uh, as you see from the dictionary, this is a very uh, highly curved uh, ADS or uh, the extreme Lambda goes to zero limit is the tensionless limit. Uh, this is because in the ADS dictionary, typically the radius of ADS is some power of the thought coupling. And this was, of course, the relation between the string coupling and one over n. Um, so, uh, so here, the, the nice thing of focusing on this limit is that when you consider any particular correlator, there are a finite number of holes in, in the language of my previous slide, in the sum over holes, there's a finite number of holes that you have to sum over. And it's not the infinite set of uh, uh, diagrams that you normally have, um, uh, would have at say, a strong coupling. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there's a well-defined genus expansion even at uh, weak coupling. And you can then hope to treat interactions perturbatively the way we normally do in, uh, in quantum field theory uh, textbooks uh, as correlators in a free quantum field theory. So, so that will be the, so the focus will be sort of under this lamppost. Uh, so uh, a couple of words of what, um, I will treat as an operational definition of deriving uh, ADS CFT. Uh, so, one aspect of the, or one uh, part of the ADS CFT dictionary, and in a sense, a very large part of it, uh, is that between uh, correlators. Uh, and um, perturbative correlators uh, in, the, uh, in the perturbative string theory description. So you can consider uh, genus G uh, string amplitude and an endpoint function. And the right-hand side is the string world sheet correlator, uh, uh, where, uh, so the Zs will refer to the world sheet coordinates of this uh, Riemann surface with of genus G and N punctures, and X will refer to the space-time position, which we'll take, uh, we'll consider Euclidean correlators. Um, so the space-time we'll take to be a sphere. Uh, so a d-dimensional sphere, this is the ADS d plus one times whatever um, string theory. And uh, this string theory, of course, uh, this is the string amplitude. Uh, um, which you then integrate over the modular space of all uh, Riemann surfaces. These uh, other, uh, forget about these other indices for now, They'll, uh, I'll describe them later. You can just think of them as additional quantum numbers for now. So uh, one part of the ADS-CFT dictionary, uh, one major part, as I said, is the relating the genus G amplitudes to the similar genus G contributions in the Tuft expansion uh, of the large N theory on the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is a quantum field theory correlator. Uh, that's well-defined. So one of the points um, uh, I would like to emphasize is that both sides have autonomous definitions. Uh, the left-hand side is the correlator in a quantum field theory. You can treat it in with your favorite uh, non-perturbative definition of the field theory. And which would enable you to compute the left-hand side. The right-hand side uh, is at least in many cases well-defined uh, in terms of a perturbative uh, sigma model. It's a two-dimensional, there's a two-dimensional CFT and that uh, and the rules of perturbative string theory are uh, uh, reasonably well-defined uh, to enable you to uh, compute the right-hand side. And the statement about their equality is uh, is a non-trivial mathematical statement, which and it's a well-posed question to ask: Can you show this 
uh, this equality. Of course, this presupposes that um, when I write this, this presupposes that there's a dictionary between individual states and these uh, the objects that appear on the left hand side, uh, these gauge invariant uh, core, uh, operators, they are the so called single trace operators of the uh, larger in theory, and uh, the right hand side are the physical vertex operators. Uh, corresponding to the physical states of the uh, string theory as defined by the usual physical state conditions in a perturbative uh, CFT. And you ex mm, uh, there is supposed to be a dictionary between the two sides. Uh, th there's supposed to be a match between the Hilbert spaces in the first place, which is what uh, this, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, this correspondence would be. So, it, so assuming you have a match of the spectrum, then you can go on to ask, are the correlators uh, the same? So one, uh, uh, this, uh, as I said, this making this equality, showing the equality, and not just in just demonstrating the right hand side, uh, not just calculating, but to kind of make it manifest and to sort of tautologize this correspondence in some sense is what uh, one is after. Uh, that, that I think would really tell you how this, uh, how that would answer the question of how large end field theories are uh, dual to string theories and uh, vice versa. So, uh, so recently um, uh, we have uh, focused on a very special case of the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence, which I think makes much of this discussion very concrete and explicit. It's a testing ground for a derivation, uh, if you wish, uh, and um, uh, to show this equality. So the, the claim is that string theory on this supersymmetric background, the ADS3 times S3 times D4, one of the uh, uh, original background studied by Maldesena in his paper. Uh, uh, but now with one unit of NSNS flux, with the smallest amount of flux, and the flux could be uh, an admixture in general of Ramon Ramon and NSNS, but uh, we'll consider this um, pure NSNS case. The, uh, the claim is that this is dual to, the, uh, to a 2D CFT, which is uh, so-called symmetric product CFT about whom I will have, um, about which this talk will be mostly about. This is a two-dimensional CFT in which you have, uh, you consider uh, T4, uh, in this case T4 is uh, because the T4 appearing here, you, uh, th there's a similar thing with K3 uh, replacing T4, uh, but uh, let's consider T4, it's a new the symmetric N of T4 is just taking N copies of the T4 and orbifolding by the symmetric group that permutes all these copies. Uh, and you look at the CFT in the limit as this N, the number of copies goes to infinity uh, and uh, the claim is that these two are the same uh, and uh, in the, uh, the perturbative string, in the perturbative expansion uh, where G string square is roughly mapped to one over N. But I won't go into the details of this uh, that uh, uh, covered some of this in my talk at strings and so on. Uh, I just want to point out just one or two uh, salient facts. Um, uh, so uh, the way we... Um, uh, um, the way we uh, were, uh, uh, we uh, made the equality manifest uh, in uh, uh, between the left and right hand side was starting from the string theory answer. The, the string background is a well-defined world sheet background, and we showed that quite remarkably at this tensionless limit, the world sheet correlators on the right hand side here. Uh, actually are delta function localized to very specific points on the modulized space. So for simplicity, I will now onwards consider the case where the genus is zero. Much of this can be generalized and has been generalized, but um, uh, so genus uh, zero. Uh, so uh, so the, uh, the right hand side localizes uh, in the sense that the, uh, there uh, you get contributions not uh, at every point on the modulized space. So the modulized space of the n 
uh, punctured uh, sphere is essentially, um, uh, I mean, what you would naively think, putting n minus three points on the sphere uh, after fixing three points at zero, one, and infinity. Uh, the claim is that not, uh, if I specify the xi's, then the points zi are actually determined by um, these delta functions. And these delta functions are ones which relate the target space xi to the world sheet zi through what is called a covering map or a branch cover x equal to gamma of z, such that the points zi are branch points uh, with a branching wi, which means essentially that this branch cover looks in the vicinity of the insertion zi. It looks like xi plus some coefficient times z minus zi to the wi. So it sort of vanishes to order wi. So that's the main thing you need to know of what a branch cover is. I'll tell you more things about it. But essentially, it's like a branch point. Uh, x equal to z square would be the simplest non-trivial branching. Um, uh, so, And that corresponds to a sort of a double cover of the sphere. Uh, x equal to z to the n is a sort of n-fold cover. Uh, anyhow, now, so this is... Uh, and the claim is that there are n minus three delta functions that localize this integral here to precisely the points uh, which um, uh, admit these covering maps with this property. Uh, and I'll say more about the, the nature of these covering maps later. Uh, we uh, recently also showed in another paper, which I will not talk about, how this localization on the string theory side follows from some kind of a twistorial relation, but uh, that makes the localization very manifest. But anyway, I, I will not be focusing on that aspect here. The but uh, I'm sorry, uh, so, so yes. Apologize for joining the seminar. And may I ask a question at this point already? Uh, definitely, Amit, yes. Um, so uh, everything on your first transparency uh, seems to be completely independent on the S3 times T4. Uh, so in principle, why wouldn't you say the same thing for any string theory on ADS3 at level k equal to 1? S3 times T4 is the most problematic among them. Uh, but I don't see anywhere in what you said something that uses the fact that the internal space is S3 times T4. Am I wrong about something? Uh, uh, you're partially uh, correct in the sense that the S3 is important because actually the ADS3 times S3 forms this super group, PSU 1, 1 slash 2. But, but, but uh, you, you never mentioned super groups or whatever. You were talking about some uh, holomorphic uh, maps uh, into yes, ADS3 yes. and calculated something with this. Nowhere have I heard not only supergroups, but I haven't heard S3 times T4. Before. Yes, that's because, I mean, that you would hear in this talk in the Strings 20. I was just summarizing the result, which is... No, no, I, I, sure, I, I know that I will hear it, but I, that's why I want to understand yes. at this stage, uh, well, so where this, is the thing that you are going to calculate goes anything it, about the internal space. This is hidden in the statement here that the world sheet correlators are localized. This localization property and this twistorial property here, all these uh, uh, very much. So, where, where is it hidden? S3. The, where, where is it hidden uh, in the internal space? Uh, it's, that's the, 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 the T4 part is relatively uh, inessential, which is why I uh, uh, yeah. agreed with you there. But the S3 is very important for multiple reasons, which I. Um, as I said, that's, that is material which I didn't want to go over, but I just very briefly, it is because the, the nature of that supergroup PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 that describes this uh, at level one, the corresponding sigma model has this property that the world sheet correlators localize. This localization you will recognize is a very strong property. It doesn't happen for the k greater than one theories. And so this, uh, and this is also implicit when, because the level- no, I, I'm not talking about k greater than one theories. I talk about k equal to one theories. For yes. instance, uh, uh, the super string on ADS3 times uh, T3. Uh, so I'm saying that these theories at k equal to one 
uh, with ADS3 times S3 have this very special property that their correlators localize uh, to points. And uh, that's a subject in a sense of a separate seminar, why that happens, but it is, uh, it is a non-trivial fact, which is not obvious by any means, but it is true. Uh, and this has been now, this was in our original paper. We showed this in, in a particular way using what identities of the theory at k equal to one, but uh, it follows more transparently from a certain twistorial relation coming from a free field realization of this ADS three times F three piece of the Sigma model. So it's not an obvious fact. And I just want uh, to make this as a, it will not be important for the rest of my talk because I will be not focusing so much on the string theory side and trying to, um, and uh, it will be the other way around. But I'm happy to tell you more later separately about why exactly the S3 is very crucial there. Uh, Okay, so if that's okay, then uh, let me actually go. So this was in a sense, uh, part of, uh, as I said, uh, the background, uh, but coming back to the broad uh, issue of the equality, there's uh, of correlators in the field theory with correlators in the uh, string theory, there's an apparent asymmetry. You might have noticed an apparent asymmetry in what I mentioned. It's easier to go as we did from the right hand side to the left hand side, from strings to fields. There's a well defined world sheet theory. I was mentioning some features of that just now. Uh, there's a well defined world sheet theory. You can compute correlators in it. You can uh, try to um, uh, then uh, see. And as I mentioned last time, these correlators, in fact, have delta function support. And uh, that's how we, in fact, connected them to the uh, correlators of the symmetric orbifold. But supposing I didn't, I left aside the string theory as such, and I, I was just given the quantum field theory, and I had to go from the field theory to the string theory, so from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, this seems a little more of a reverse engineering problem. It's sort of an inverse problem in the sense that you need to reconstruct a world sheet integrand. Here you have an integrated quantity over the modulized space that's equal to this uh, object on the right hand side. So of course a world sheet integrand as most of you know is not unique because that you can things can differ by total derivatives and so on. Uh, Nevertheless, that doesn't uh, mean that there cannot be a canonical or a very natural form for the correlator on the right hand side. Uh, and one of the aims uh, of this very general free fields to ADS program uh, has been to recast the quantum field theory correlators on the left hand side into stringy correlators on the right hand side in some canonical form. And the so I, let me just explain the basic idea of this way to go from the left hand side to the right hand side, and we'll see a realization of this in this particular case. But uh, but let me just very uh, in pictures summarize the idea, and later we'll uh, see the equations behind the pictures. So the basic idea is that the sum over what we, what we call Feynman diagrams in a perturbative or a free uh, large n theory, these are essentially world line topologies because that's what Feynman diagrams are. So the sum over all the distinct Feynman diagrams or distinct world sheet topology, world line topologies in Feynman diagrams gives a sum, uh, I claim that it can be organized into a sum over the distinct world sheets after gluing up the double lines that, uh, that define the large N uh, Feynman diagrams. Uh, so, uh, so in fact, actually a stronger statement holds. So, but what I just said was the statement and uh, that the sum over all the Feynman diagrams here is equal to a sum over the world sheets. This is in some sense has to be true, but the, I claim there's a very specific way in which to each Feynman diagram, I can associate a closed sheet or a point in the modulized space of the Riemann surfaces here. Uh, and that is as, and this association is a specific implementation of open closed string duality 
where you can think of the these open string world sheets as essentially, I mean, the Feynman diagrams, uh, the ribbon graphs of the large end Feynman diagrams as open string world sheets, which then get glued up into a closed string world sheet in a very specific way. And this exploits a certain very nice and very physical, actually, parametrization of the modular space uh, uh, due to the mathematics uh, of uh, Strebel differentials, which I will come to uh, later. But uh, this parametrization gives this very natural way in which you can associate to each Feynman graph. So I want to emphasize this, that each Feynman graph we are associating with a closed string world sheet. This is, in some sense, a refinement of the Toft idea. Toft associated, as everyone knows, a genus to the Feynman diagrams. And this was uh, the genus expansion that he could classify, organize Feynman diagrams in terms of their topology. But I'm claiming that each Feynman diagram is now a particular point on a Riemann surface, on the modelized space of Riemann surfaces. And the, the sum over the Feynman graphs can be re, re written as a integral over the corresponding modelized space of Riemann surfaces. So this is sort of a, this is the first signature that you can have, um, have uh, um, the field theories organize themselves into string world sheets. And we'll see uh, how this happens in uh, the specific case here. Right. This was sort of very general, but if any questions I can, I yeah, have can a, I question? Ask a question. Yes. Uh, so when you say a Feynman uh, diagram, you mean a Feynman diagram with a given uh, internal moment or something? Some uh, uh, so you integrate over the, all the moment. Yeah. So I mean the whole Feynman diagram where you have integrated over the momenta uh, and uh, you you have the contribution from. I, I'll be a little more precise later. It's actually a. Uh, you have to glue, you have to consider the so-called skeleton Feynman diagrams. That is uh, all the Feynman diagrams with the same topology, the world line topology. So uh, if you have multiple big contractions, you kind of glue them together, uh, which are homotopic, you glue them together to a single uh, 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 big contraction. So it's, it, you have to do a little bit of reorganization, but essentially all the Feynman graphs of a given topology are the ones that um, uh, world line topology are the ones that give you uh, mm, uh, a point on the world street, uh, the string world sheet. But uh, yes, uh, with all the momenta and everything, you've done all the momentum integrals. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Mm, yes. Uh, so, what is the meaning of uh, moving in the moduli space of Riemann surfaces uh, in the Feynman diagram picture? Uh, it is the, it will be the sum, it will become a little more clear. So what will actually, okay, let me just say it here. So in the free theory, uh, as we will see, I, I mentioned here that you, you're, you get localized to points on the modelized space. Um, and now the points on the, these are discrete points on the modelized space. And these discrete points that uh, uh, appear here are the ones which correspond to the discrete points that uh, are associated to the different Feynman graph topologies. Now, in some sense, when the number of big contractions becomes very large, it sort of covers the whole modelized space as we will see. Uh, um, so maybe if you ask me the question at the end, uh, we'll see that there's a continuous parameter which emerges, which essentially will uh, cover the whole modelized space. So Rajesh, this dictionary is applicable only when the right-hand side localizes to points? And, and no, it is uh, supposed to be uh, more general. In fact, in the particular case that I will consider, it will the points will become dense and cover the whole modelized space. I, I think it is true that any free theory will have this localization. So in a free theory, there will be only a discrete number of points uh, for a fixed correlator. There'll be a discrete number of points, though it can become dense and cover it. But as you go away from the free point, effectively that localization will not be there. So this localization phenomenon that I mentioned, I believe is true in general of the string theories dual to uh, free Youngness. But uh, infinitesimally away, 
you will not have this because you will have many diagrams uh, contributing and that will sort of fill up the modular space, even for a small correlator. Uh, but exactly how that happens away from the free point, yeah, I, I mean, I think that still remains to be fleshed out um, more concretely. But for now, I, I, I will uh, uh, stick to the well-defined context of the free field point and uh, the string theory dual to it, which is in some sense will be a very simple string theory. It's a, this localization in a sense uh, uh, suggests that it's a sort of a topological string theory, uh, but that's what I think the dual to free, uh, free field, large and free field theories are. So as I said, we'll try to implement this program in this test case where the uh, two-dimensional CFT is the symmetric product CFT uh, with, uh, and we'll always take this limit where K goes to infinity. So as I said, I need to tell you some background about this, um, uh, about um, some of the, um, uh, something that will be important later. So we, uh, uh, we will consider the simplest set of correlators, namely the correlators of ground states of, a, uh, so the grounds, uh, there are, uh, uh, because it's an orbifold CFT, there are uh, twisted sectors and each twisted sector is labeled by the length W of the cycle in that twisted sector. Uh, and uh, this, uh, um, uh, th this uh, uh, is the, the ground state in that given twisted sector is a unique, uh, there's a twist operator which creates, if you wish, the W cycle twisted sector. And you can consider the ground state correlator. Uh, you will see, I mean, I mean, I can explain later, but uh, uh, considering excited states is sort of just, again, adding bells and whistles. It's like what you normally do even in string theory, you consider this, these are the analogs of tachyon vertex operators. And you can think of these labels W as the analogs of the tachyon momenta. So we'll consider this whole family of endpoint correlators with arbitrary W1, W2 to Wn. Uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, and on the sphere. So we'll consider the uh, simplest uh, set of correlators in this orbifold, simplest non-trivial set of correlators in this orbifold CFT. So um, are, are you in the NS, uh, NS sector or the Ramon sector? Uh, the NS sector. We'll always be in the NS sector for the perturbative uh, string space. Thank you. Because we are, yeah. We'll be comparing with the dual perturbative string uh, states only. Uh, so, um, so the uh, Lunin and Mathur uh, over 20 years ago had a very nice uh, way to calculate these uh, correlators. And uh, essentially it is something that's familiar to probably many people uh, from the, the replica trick that uh, appears in entanglement entropy calculations and so on, which is that these uh, twisted sector uh, uh, operators uh, by, you can sort of undo them by lifting to a covering space uh, and uh, by look, looking at a W sheeted covering, effectively what you're doing is instead of considering um, multiple copies of T4, you can just consider one copy of T4, but on this covering space and therefore the, but with uh, arbitrary, with some multiple sheets around the branch point, around the uh, corresponding branch point. So you lift, this is your original correlator. If it was on this S2, you lift it to a covering space and, um, and then you just have a single valued uh, field, uh, in fact, a single copy of T4 on this uh, covering space, but with this branched behavior at the insertions, which are the pre-images of these XIs. So uh, associated to these XIs, you'll have some covering, auxiliary covering space, and that's this um, sigma zero N over here. And there'll be branch points, which are the pre-images of this. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so locally, this branch cover will have this branching behavior, which I had mentioned earlier as well, uh, that it will look as if it's Z minus Zi to the WI near 
any of these points uh, as, as ZI, which are the um, uh, uh, pre images. So, the insight of Lunin and Mathur was that to compute this correlator, you instead lift it and compute it here. And here you just have a single copy of T4. And in fact, the ground state just lifts to the identity operator on the covering space, because uh, that's what uh, the, 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 now the geometric twist captures the uh, effect of the, the twisting here. So you just have to compute the vacuum path integral. If I'm computing this particular correlator, I just need to compute the vacuum path integral on this um, covering space uh, with uh, the uh, where uh, uh, which is determined by this uh, covering map, and there can be multiple covering maps, and you sum over all these covering maps, and uh, there is a conformal anomaly because of the pullback. This is a conformal map. Uh, between the, so you're pulling back the path integral here to a path integral here with this conformal factor x equal to gamma of z. So there's a Liouville term that is associated with this. So th this is what I think I've said here. So the original correlator is given by a sum over contributions of all the allowed covering maps with this branching behavior. So the covering map is specified by these data uh, zi wi and if you wish three x's or alternatively you can if you specify the x's that determines n minus three of these zi's so that's what i mean by saying the covering uh, maps uh, these are the discrete uh, the and uh, to the uh, the covering maps are discrete in nature if i fix the xi then the zi are essentially fixed once i fix three let's say to three of them by Mobius transformations to zero, one and infinity, the remaining Z, n minus three of the ZIs are fixed to certain discrete values. Uh, but there are finitely many of them. And uh, I, I will, uh, you'll see more concretely how they're determined later. But as I said, there's a coordinate dependence which comes from the pullback because now there's a induced metric on the covering space and there's a you will action for that conformal factor. So the vacuum path integral uh, on the, uh, it's not just the vacuum path integral, there is the additional Liouville uh, piece, which is e to the minus the Liouville action. And this is a Liouville action for this conformal factor phi, uh, which is given by log of the mod bell gamma square. And this is the Liouville functional for this uh, conformal factor. So Sorry, this, yes. Sorry, Rajesh, the, the, the Lewell factor is the factor between this uh, this manifold and another manifold with the same uh, conformal structure, but a standard, some standard metric. Metric, exactly. So your original uh, correlator, you compute it on some flat, essentially flat S2 uh, over here. But now when you kind of pull it back, you're computing another correlator uh, on, but on this Riemann surface, but it has this uh, uh, conformal factor gamma, uh, gamma of z, and uh, it's uh, locally also flat. But because of this conformal factor, you pick up the usual you will anomaly term. That's why it's proportional to the central charge. And to get the answer for this Liouville action, you need to know what standard metric you're using on your genus G Riemann surface. Uh, it, uh, so that will uh, appear maybe in uh, no in which genus G Riemann surface? The so, the space or the yeah, yeah. Surface? Yeah, so say the covering space is, uh, let's say, a genus two Riemann surface. Yeah, so you uh, initially you have a, let's say you have a sphere, and uh, then this pullback automatically determines the metric on that covering space. Right. So this so, this this metric is fixed, and it's got some singular, and it's got some singularities at these corners, right? Exactly. Okay. And now you get the Liouville factor by sort of smoothing out the metric to take it to some smooth metric. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, you have this factor, you have to regularize this Liouville action, uh, and in, that's what uh, you, you have to be a little careful and Lunin and Mathur give a very uh, clear prescription for how to sort of regularize it. And then with, after you've normalized the, this thing, so this is the place where the whole position- Every, every, Everything comes. comes. But I, I sorry, I, I'm probably being stupid, but let me just ask. Uh, I thought what you're doing is writing this, this metric as e to the power phi, Times yes. some standard metric. Yes. And uh, so there is a choice of that standard metric. 
Yeah, that is determined by your original, uh, say, let's say on the S2, uh, you can think of it as the flat metric. On the S2, you would have a flat metric, and then let's say on genus two Riemann surface, you'd have a constant negative curvature. Oh, you metrics. mean the, if your boundary was a genus two Riemann surface? This is the boundary field theory. Right. No, but I was thinking that you, you, you in the uh, this branched cover is some gene could be some genus two Riemann surface, right? If there yeah. were five or six points. Metric is determined by the metric of the original S. Right, and then the Liouville factor is the uh, while factor between that this singular yeah. metric and some and other the, standard metric. Right? And the other standard metric, no, the other standard metric on S two. Oh, on S two, I thought it would be on this higher higher genus Riemann surface. No, 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 uh, because. Um, uh, it, it, because it is, uh, you have, it, it's just a conformal map between the two, uh, this thing. So you just pull it back. So you have, uh, you have uh, D2X, which is sort of DX by DZ. So you just get DX by DZ mod square uh, as the, that's the pullback. It's, think of it just locally, that you are just doing a local, this thing locally, you are just pulling it back to the original uh, space here. I see, I, I'll ask once again, then I'll just ask you later if I don't answer. Yeah. But let's let's suppose we take four points, four insertions, uh, four operator insertions on S two. Yeah. Then the the higher the the surface that you have, this branched cover is a torus, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, there will be there you can have branched covers which are spheres and torus both. Yeah. Okay. So let's take the case where it's a torus. Then okay. you need to specify in order to get the Liouville factor, you need to specify what the standard metric on the torus is, right? Now, in that case, it's very clear. There's a flat metric. But I, I, I was just wondering if I'm mistaken. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the thing is, I think the, this is a local statement, right? I mean, the, of the uh, this thing is uh, you just don't, I mean, you can uh, re-express it in terms of the flat metric or whatever favorite metric you have on that higher genus surface. But the Liouville factor is just coming from this pullback, which is, uh, I mean, if I just take a neighborhood here, and I'm just considering the path integral now, but I'm just parameterizing. So locally, my path integral doesn't know whether it's a genus two surface or a genus one surface or whatever. And so locally, I'm, I'm just have a conformal anomaly. That's all. I, see. I, I thought you would get this Liouville factor times the partition function on this higher genus manifold with some metric. And that would know yeah, about that. I, I, I mean, that, that, but in the case of the, uh, yeah, I mean, in general, you will have, uh, there will be a, there'll be the Liouville factor times the other partition function. But of course, in this particular case, I'm considering the identity. So it's essentially just the vacuum path integral. So it's a normalization factor. Uh, okay, thanks. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, so th that would be independent of the uh, any of this uh, this thing. But when you consider excitations, then there will be indeed an additional uh, piece because you will be now considering a path integral on that higher genus surface. Uh, and yeah, indeed, you can uh, then normalize it with whatever the metric is, uh, 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 whatever you, uh, yeah, your favorite metric. You do the path integral with that local metric uh, on the higher genus surface. Okay, so that's, that's lunin mathurs method of computing these correlators, which will be important uh, for what uh, we have to, uh, what I have to say. Um, but there's another piece of background I want to, uh, uh, to mention, which uh, will be important, which is that uh, normally you don't think of symmetric product CFTs in the same language as you think um, of large N Feynman diagrams in say free Yang Mills and so on. But, uh, but actually there was a very nice picture which shows that there is a way of uh, viewing, uh, the, uh, viewing the correlators uh, in, as a sum over Feynman diagrams. So the sum over this, so this lunin mathur picture where you say that each correlator uh, that the correlator of the CFT is a uh, sum over covering map contributions, you can associate a Feynman diagram, a free field like Feynman diagram to each such covering map contribution. So the way these people did it uh, again over 10 years ago is you think again of your original target space and let's say a four point function and uh, you draw a curve 
going through these four points uh, in some way, but think of it as a bifundamental curve, like a dashed curve and a solid curve. And so the solid loop, let's say uh, we take the convention that it encloses infinity uh, and the dashed loop is the rest of the, the other hemisphere, uh, X equal to infinity. Uh, so, uh, so the idea was very nice, which is that you you take a look at this region you just draw this curve and and just pull it back by the same covering map to the z space by the same uh, pullback that i uh, had over here now it's a multi cover so each of these faces will go into some faces on the higher genus surface in this case it's a degree 3 cover so there are sort of three copies of this and uh, and uh, so you will get uh, some kind of a uh, part, uh, some kind of a triangulation of the dual space and in fact this is uh, exactly the same kind of thing it's a uh, so you will uh, it's a toft like diagram but for bifundamental lines uh, and uh, if n is the degree of the map there will be n pre-images, let's say of x equal to infinity. These are the poles, and that's what I've shown over here. Uh, the, the poles of gamma of z, because uh, poles of gamma of z are the ones that take you to x equal to infinity. So the poles of the covering map are essentially these points. Uh, and, um, and you have, uh, uh, and once again, you get w, or rather two wi edges coming out of the corresponding vertex. So you can think of this as the Feynman diagram computation of this correlator where I have vertices, uh, the operator sigma wi has wi or two wi edges coming out of it. Uh, and, uh, and you are essentially looking at different wick contractions of these. So each different covering map corresponds to sort of different weak contractions amongst these different correlators. So, uh, so this is a free, this is a free field like Feynman diagram uh, picture for these covering maps and their contributions. So this is something that these people uh, sort of uh, made explicit. So for each covering map, you get a Feynman diagram very much like uh, you have in field theory, where you get a sum over finite number of covering map uh, Feynman diagrams. Here you have a sum over finite number of covering map contributions, and each of them you can think of as a Feynman diagram of this particular, with this sort of toft like triangulation of the world sheet. So that's um, uh, something that uh, uh, I, I, I want you to keep in mind. So. But now let me say a little bit about these covering maps themselves. These covering maps are very hard to write down explicitly. Even for a four-point function on a sphere, it's very difficult to write down except in special cases. So we'll stick to the case where the covering space is also a genus zero surface, uh, and, uh, but there will be n branch points and we'll consider degree n maps. So, so we are taking the covering space to be a sphere and the target space we'll also always take to be a sphere. Recall that this is the boundary CFT. So the boundary CFT is living on the S2 and this is what will be the world sheet, but it's now the, just this covering space. So if you want to construct all covering maps for an endpoint function, uh, and uh, of degree n, uh, degree uh, the uh, the genus uh, the degree of the covering map is actually specified by a formula which I'll have in a uh, in later transparency. It's a uh, it's, it's specified by the WI. So it's, uh, it's the Riemann Hurwitz formula. So uh, now a degree n map can be viewed as a rational map. Uh, so it's just a degree n polynomial divided by another degree n polynomial. Uh, so you might think, okay, it's uh, you can now, um, uh, so the, uh, uh, the conditions that define the covering map are relatively easy to, uh, uh, to specify because you can, uh, this I've just parameterized the denominator polynomial in terms of its roots. It's a nth degree polynomial and uh, uh, it has n roots, lambda a. 
Uh, so when we consider the derivative of gamma, uh, the derivative of gamma is the one which shows the branching. We know that del gamma behaves as z minus zi to the power wi minus one near any of the branch points. So you actually, uh, you can easily convince yourself that del gamma has to be a product of all these z minus zi uh, to the wi minus one factors in the numerator. And because these are uh, single poles, when you take a derivative, you get double poles. Uh, and I've chosen a convention where Zn is infinity, but that won't matter so much. Uh, but um, so del gamma looks like this. So on very general grounds, a covering map, it looks like this. But the question is, how do you uh, determine this map? If I give you the Zis and the Wis, if I give you this data of the Zis and Wis, how do, how do I determine this covering map? So the, the conditions for determining it, there's a very nice parameterization that was done in this paper, and, uh, uh, is just that del gamma should not have any simple poles at z equal to lambda a. So the, uh, if you were to just expand this and look at the behavior near z equal to lambda a, you know that there can't be any single poles because if there were single poles in z minus lambda a, when you integrate del gamma, you would have gotten a log but there is no log in gamma. So uh, you know that gamma is a rational uh, fraction. So it's, um, uh, so this, there's residues at the z equal to lambda a, the simple pole uh, residues must vanish. And that gives you a very simple set of equations which I have written down here and which will play an important role. Uh, so essentially these are equations, these are n equations for uh, so the condition that at each of the lambda a there is no uh, simple pole gives you n equations for uh, uh, for each of these lambda a's, and uh, the n equations are essentially take this form where w i is this branching data, and the lambda a's are these. Uh, so these are what, in fact, uh, Rumpadak is. Uh, uh, referred to them as scattering equations because you can see they are very similar to the sort of. Uh, Kachazo, He, Yuan type of scattering equations. But in any case, these are equations which have to be solved for these n poles lambda a. Uh, and in general, these are not very easy to write down explicit solutions, even for n equal to four. Uh, uh, for little n equal to four, uh, you, it, it's not very easy to write down the uh, write down explicit solutions. Uh, so, so the but. In principle, these equations, solving these equations gives you, uh, essentially fixes your del gamma. Okay, uh, so that's sort of the background. Okay, so I think I've already taken a long time to get to uh, the, uh, the heart of our calculation. Uh, so uh, as I said, we'll study these correlators, but uh, we'll consider a special limit where all these WIs are essentially very large. So these WIs, as I said, label the twisted sectors uh, and uh, the conformal dimensions HI of these operators uh, go like W square by W or essentially they are proportional to W when W becomes large. So the large conformal dimension is large W vice versa. And we'll take a scaling limit where W's go to infinity such that this W over N, N is this degree of the map, which as I said, is given by this Riemann Horowitz formula in terms of the, all the W's. Uh, so this will keep this ratio fixed to be something alpha I. So that's just essentially a fraction, a number between uh, zero and half or something like that. And um, this, uh, so we'll, consider this correlator in such a limit. And this is a bit like the Gross-Mende limit because you're, like I said, you, if you think of these as tachyon vertex operators, uh, you're essentially scaling uniformly all the dimensions. So it's sort of a fixed, ang fixed angle, high energy scattering limit in this tensionless ADS3. Uh, so the dimensions are correspondingly, the energies are very large. Now, then uh, uh, the correlator gets contributions from a finite number of covering maps, as I mentioned earlier, in general. Uh, uh, 
the number of these covering maps actually scales as some power of n. Uh, um, uh, this uh, this n for any finite n, of course, it is uh, finite. Uh, but what uh, you notice is that as n goes to infinity, these become these go to infinity as well. So you get an infinite number of solutions. And another way to say it is that as n goes to infinity, these equations will have a large set of uh, sort of a space of uh, solutions. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so these, uh, but at any finite n, of course, as I said, this lunan mathur covering maps uh, uh, appear at uh, just some fixed number, finite number of points on the modelized space. So the question is whether can we see by taking n to infinity, can we see the full stringy modelized space as you uh, take these to infinity? And we'll see indeed that that's what happens. And the way to do it is to take the sort of gross mendel like limit that you begin to see the whole modelized space. So, so let me come back to the uh, what I just mentioned about the covering maps. You recall that this covering del gamma was like this, and there were these scattering equations that determined this. Uh, and um, the, so the, the crucial observation, the crucial technical observation is that these equations in this now in this large n limit, the, these uh, alpha, uh, the only change from before is that I'm sort of assuming we are taking, uh, just replace the wi minus one in terms of these alphas, which are the things that you hold fixed as n goes to infinity uh, and wi by n is alpha i. Uh, and so these equations, uh, to those who have, anyone who has worked with matrix models will immediately recognize these equations. These are saddle points of a matrix model where lambda a can be, these are the, like the saddle point equations of a matrix model where the lambda a play the role of uh, eigenvalues. And this plays the role of the sort of the, uh, the force between the, uh, uh, the external potential in which the eigenvalues are in. And uh, in fact, this particular form is that corresponding to a log potential because this is essentially w prime the, the derivative of the potential is the one that it's a, uh, for matrix model, people who are not familiar with matrix model, this piece comes from the logarithmic Coulomb repulsion uh, or the van der Monde factor in matrix models. Uh, um, and then uh, the saddle point means balancing that with the external potential, the force from the external potential, which is W prime. And that W prime, uh, for, uh, if W prime takes this form that corresponds to uh, a logarithmic potential like this. And this is, in fact, these such matrix models have been studied in the literature. Uh, they are what are called Penner-like matrix models. They appeared in the context of the AGT in this particular, uh, in, I mean, uh, precisely these sort of matrix models actually did appear. So uh, how do you solve uh, for, uh, so, so in other words, even though it might be very difficult to solve these equations for any finite n, at large n, you can actually use the techniques of matrix models to learn something about the solutions of these equations. So that is the, uh, the thing that we will exploit. Uh, so, the, uh, so the way matrix models like these are solved is by first defining something called the resolvent. It's a complex function, uh, which essentially is uh, uh, determined by the so-called eigenvalue density, rho of lambda. And uh, 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 you integrate uh, this over the support of the eigenvalue density. And uh, this uh, uh, is what you call the uh, resolvent. And it is uh, well known in the matrix literature and in fact, uh, uh, originally goes back to Spenta that uh, uh, the uh, way to solve this matrix models is to write down the so-called loop equation, uh, which is if you, uh, uh, the, instead of the resolvent, if you just actually uh, define the slightly different quantity Y of Z, which is in, uh, the W prime, W of Z is the potential, this logarithmic potential. Uh, and if you define Y of Z in, uh, in this way, then Y obeys the so-called loop equation, uh, which is uh, uh, which I have written down here. Uh, 
uh, it, it's a, a, there's a piece which is quadratic in y square and a piece which is the derivative of y, uh, y with respect to z. And the right hand side is, uh, uh, is, uh, is determined in terms of the potential. R of z is, is also something which, is, uh, which you can parameterize. In, uh, in, as uh, I'll come to that a bit. Uh, but the whole point is that you can think of this as actually a differential equation determining what y of z is. And that's how you solve for the resolvent. Uh, that's one way to solve for the resolvent. So the spectral curve, uh, this y of z is sometimes called the spectral curve. Uh, uh, the spectral curve in our case actually has a very nice interpretation because recall this definition, it's W prime minus uh, the uh, resolvent. And that's essentially this combination uh, for us. And this is nothing but uh, a logarithmic derivative of the um, covering map in this, uh, in this particular combination. And which in fact is nothing but the Liouville field of Lunin and Mathur. Uh, you recall this phi was, essentially this conformal factor. So this, uh, this spectral curve is very closely related to this Liouville field of uh, Lun uh, Lunin and Mathur. So, uh, so this uh, uh, equation is a way to solve uh, this matrix model. And the way you do it is first uh, take a leading order in N. Actually this equation here as it stands is true for any finite N. But when you take large N, this term drops out. Uh, these terms are subleading in one over n. And you see, instead of a differential equation, it's actually just an algebraic equation. It just becomes y square in, is given in terms of uh, y, uh, y naught square. The leading piece is just w prime square minus this uh, extra piece. This extra piece is, uh, is also, a, uh, so if I uh, use the definition of r of z, you can see that the extra piece can be parameterized in terms of a polynomial of degree n minus three. If I use the form of the potential we have, it's uh, uh, this y square is a polynomial of degree two n minus four divided by product of z minus zi, the whole square. So I've just rationalized uh, uh, the polynomial. And, and, and there's an unknown polynomial r uh, of degree n minus three, that's what uh, this uh, R not, all the information of R not is captured by this uh, unknown polynomial over here. So the way you normally solve in a matrix model is you impose certain conditions that determine the unknown coefficients of this polynomial. So the way, one way to do it is to uh, consider the integrals of, uh, so this polynomial I mean, this y naught square over here, you see it has branch cuts uh, because there's a polynomial in the numerator which has two n minus four zeros. So if I take y naught, the y naught has uh, square root branch cuts and you get precisely n minus two cuts uh, uh, in this uh, from coming from the numerator. And it has uh, y naught square also has double poles at the original z i's, z i's remember, are the positions, the branch points, and the positions where the vertex operators were inserted. So uh, uh, the, you can consider the n minus three parameters in this polynomial and n minus three cross ratios. You can think of them as unknowns. Uh, so one way to set up the problem is to treat these uh, as the unknowns. And you uh, fix these unknowns by uh, by specifying the periods or the integrals of this y naught over the cuts, the different, there are two n minus, uh, there are n minus uh, uh, two cuts and therefore it's a sort of a Riemann surface of a genus n minus three. So there are n minus three a cycles and n minus three b cycles and you specify the periods, the two n minus six periods. And that uh, we'll see what the meaning of this periods are. We'll see the meaning of this interpretation is, but this is one of the standard 
uh, ways in which uh, this is, uh, these are often called the filling fractions in the matrix model literature. So you uh, specify the filling fractions uh, because essentially why not, if you remember, is related to the resolvent. And this integral is essentially telling you, capturing this period integral is capturing the discontinuity of the resolvent or the eigenvalue density. And these, these therefore capture the number of uh, eigenvalues. But we'll come to that later. But uh, this is, uh, so, uh, so then you've completely specified your matrix model in uh, you by the solution to your matrix model uh, because you fix these n minus three parameters and n minus three cross ratios by fixing these uh, two n minus six periods. And, these, in fact, will parameterize the different covering map solutions. So instead of now having a discrete family of covering maps, your covering maps will be specified by these 2n minus 6 parameters. So in this large n limit, you have a whole family of solutions, and they are specified by these mu's and mu's. And that's so instead of a discrete set of covering maps, you get a sort of a continuous as family, which is specified by these parameters. Uh, and um, and that, uh, so because once you know why not, you know what del gamma is uh, because of this equation. So, so this is sort of the um, mm, uh, way in which you would solve the matrix model and hence obtain your covering map to leading order in N. But uh, uh, we'll mostly look at the leading order, but I just want to point out a very uh, something that will play a role at the end, uh, uh, which is that if you just include that one over n correction on the right hand left hand side of the loop equation, recall that it was this factor, uh, this combination y square minus two over n y prime that appeared. If I write this uh, and y, uh, if you remember, I uh, told you it's related to the del of log del gamma. So if you just look at this combination here, quite remarkably, it is this Schwarzian of this covering map. So the Schwarz, so the loop equations, if you actually include the one over n corrections, take a very nice form that it tells you that the Schwarzian of the covering map is given in terms of uh, the potential in a very specific way. So this is a differential equation, a Schwarzian differential equation, which specifies the covering map in terms of the details of your potential. And in fact, this left-hand side transforms as a quadratic differential, which will be important. Uh, this also has the behavior near the double poles uh, with this residue over here. Uh, near, because remember the y, uh, y of z uh, a y square, you could already see this in y square of z has these double poles and, and, and the residues in fact are proportional to alpha i squared to leading order. So is there any question till now? Uh, because before I, so this was the technical part. If it was a little uh, dense, uh, uh, I'm happy to t talk afterwards, but uh, if there's a very general question, I can uh, take uh, it. Hi, uh, Rajesh. Uh... Yeah. Yes, I have a very general question. Uh, so I'm a novice in this field. So uh, I have now in your talk also heard about the scaling limit. Uh, so could you just uh, tell a bit about like what is a scaling limit and are there other scaling limits in string theory as well? Any other famous scaling limits? So uh, I mean, the uh, physicists in general, of course, take uh, many scaling limits depending on the uh, situation they want to study. Uh, perhaps you're referring to this particular limit that we took over here. Um, this is a, a limit, a high energy limit. And as I said, it is somewhat like the so-called gross mende limit that was uh, studied in high energy scattering in flat space. Uh, here, the natural way to take such a limit is to scale all the Ws uniformly. Um, uh, uh, with uh, the degree keeping this combination fixed. So, uh, so it's a way of taking a, ex a limit, a limiting case, but specifying what you keep fixed in that limit. So you do a certain scaling of all your parameters such that certain other parameters are kept fixed. So this is what we have done over here. Uh, and uh, sorry, why was it required? 
that is what is physically meaningful and gives also a mathematically well-defined uh, answers. So this is the limit if you want to take certain uh, high energy limit where uh, all the dimensions scale uniformly, but yet sort of the angle, it's a fixed angle scattering. This is the sort of natural. So all the energies or dimensions are scaling uniformly with N in a particular way. So that's the natural limit you would study here of high right energy. and this makes the theory uh, still an approximation so the theory is not exact it's an approximation it is the the theory the underlying uh, i'm considering a particular limit of the correlators in a particular theory and we are so there's a there's a sense in which just like you take any limits in calculus or anywhere uh, you there's a sense in which there's a leading order term which is the 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 uh, the limiting answer and then there are systematic corrections around it so yes it is about the sub leading terms uh, no the leading as well as sub leading both uh, so i will in fact focus mostly on the leading terms right right thanks the so uh, uh, i i actually have a question yeah. again uh, sure. so uh, if i followed the uh, uh, Correctly, I, I must admit I, I was disturbed, so I didn't hear everything that was said so far. But if I understand correctly, uh, in the symmetric product, you study certain properties of symmetric products that uh, are blind completely to the structure of the block. Is that correct? Uh, which are, uh, I'm looking at these correlators in the symmetric product, the ground state, twisted sector ground state correlators, uh, just, uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah. So, so again, so it's completely blind to the structure of the block of the symmetric product. Let's suppose the symmetric oh, product. You mean whether is, it's a T four or so on? Yeah, uh, let, let's suppose the symmetric product it is time is some CFT m uh, yeah. to the power of n modded by S n. Nothing yes. in is presented so far. Yeah. Yeah. Knows about the structure of the CFT m. Is that correct? Uh, except in a very mild way, when you look at the twisted sector ground states, the, these energies, of course, I've written down here for the torus. Oh, on the, the central charge. You know, it knows about the central charge of the block. It knows about the central charge, a few mild things. But indeed, uh, one of the strengths, I think, is that it is largely insensitive to uh, uh, the, uh, at least when we study the ground state correlators, it, very little is needed. If you study excitations, you will need some facts about the excitation. But again, you know, it, it goes back to my previous question because you yes. know I, I expect generically that for k equal to one, you get a symmetric product of a block with central charge c equal to six. Yes. And so so, that's far, why this so far, nothing that I saw uh, 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 depends on the details of what the internal space in string theory on ADS3 k equal to one is. And in the dual, it does not care about the structure of the block M, which obviously depends on the internal space in the string theory in ADS three level one. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's the situation. I, I, I remember your, your, your answer to my previous question, but at the moment, nothing was changed with my question. Yes, I mean, as I said, there are two parts. There's the ADS three times S three, which we used late uh, in the previous, uh, in the previous, this thing where we were going from the string theory to the field theory, we used the fact that there's an S3 and that was important, but the T4 was not very important. Uh, in what I'm doing right now, in fact, it's just the symmetric product nature that's important. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the, I can address some aspects of that maybe at the end if there's time. Um, uh, but indeed, what much of what I've said is very insensitive to what kind of symmetric product uh, one is considering. I, I so, have a quick question. Uh, yes. Uh, so in the previous slide before, uh, yeah, so here the connection to quadratic differentials, uh, is it uh, all orders in one over n statement or is it just yeah, like because this is an all orders in one over n statement. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. Thanks. So, um, so okay. I, so what I let me just uh, if you got lost with the technicalities, let me just summarize what I essentially uh, uh, said uh, so far. Uh, uh, what I was doing was I was telling you a way in which you can solve for covering maps in a particular limit 
in this large n scaling limit. Uh, and the technical tool that allowed you to do that was the matrix, the mapping to this matrix model, this penner like matrix model. And the uh, loop equation solution of this matrix model uh, admit, gave you very naturally a whole family of covering map solutions. And these were parameterized by these uh, um, so-called periods of this uh, uh, spectral curve. Uh, so on this uh, auxiliary uh, uh, Riemann surface of genus n minus three. This, uh, by the way, this uh, these cycles are on an yet another Riemann surface. This is a third one, not not the original S two, not the covering space. This is a further auxiliary Riemann surface, uh, which is the solution of the matrix model. But in any case, uh, so this uh, the matrix model solution. Uh, is parameterizing all the different covering maps that you can have. Uh, and so it's a way of solving uh, for those scattering equations at large n. So now I want to tell you the meaning of that and why that sort of tells you how you cover the modelized space and why, in fact, it gives you a very natural covering of the modelized space. So this spectral curve if you recall from its definition, it's essentially was the resolvent and the resolvent was given in terms of the eigenvalue density. So the spectral curve, it determines the density of these poles, lambda A. Remember lambda A were the poles of the covering map. And uh, so it determines the poles in the colored loops of the Feynman diagram. So when I showed you this Feynman diagram picture associated with covering maps, I had these poles, these black dots in each of these uh, faces, uh, in each of the colored faces, there were the, um, uh, the uh, uncolored faces and the colored faces and the poles were in the colored faces and um, uh, and uh, what we are seeing now is that in the large n limit, when you're considering a covering map with very with these vertex operate with these operators with large number w i, so you should think of the sigma w i as something like trace of phi to the w i or phi to the two w i. It's an operator with many many. Uh, uh, legs coming out of it, two wi legs coming out of it, and two wj out of the jth vertex. And there are multiple sort of contractions between them. And uh, so if I have a part of, a, um, uh, in, a, in a covering map, if I have a sort of a, a Feynman diagram like picture where I have these multiple big contractions, there in each of these, there will be these poles lambda a and the spectral curve is essentially measuring the number of these poles. It's counting the eigenvalue density of these poles. And I've written once again that spectral curve here. It has uh, these uh, different cuts and uh, it, has these, uh, it has these double poles. So the branch cuts are between the zeros. And, um, and so then what the periods are counting is very simple. This number ni is essentially, a new i is essentially counting the number of poles that are there between the vertices, the corresponding, the dual vertices uh, between the zi and the zj. Remember the vertices are where, the, uh, where these uh, poles of zi are and the zeros are where the, and the cuts are. And uh, so I'm integrating along a cut like this, that's measuring the number of eigenvalues or the number, a number of these poles, lambda A, which is in turn the measure of the number of big contractions between these two uh, vertices. And uh, so, and there are precisely that many big uh, contractions. So now you can get a picture for how this matrix model is really capturing all the different Feynman diagrams, because you can have uh, to any given correlator and think of free Yang-Mills theory, any given correlator with trace phi to the two wi, there will be many diagrams as wi becomes large and they will be parameterized by the numbers of big contractions between, the, between two pairs of edges. And, uh, and you have to sum over all the different ways of allocating big contractions between the uh, different edges. And that these different numbers 
of big contractions scaled in the large n limit are precisely these periods. So the solutions that we are seeing are precisely all the different covering maps and they are labeled by these periods. So this is the uh, central observation that gives meaning to this calculation that we've done. So I, I showed over here a sort of a piece between two vertices and that gives you the, for a given cup. Uh, but the global picture is that I have these uh, different, so again, think of this like a free Young Mills diagram, because uh, essentially it's the same thing. And you have these multiple big contractions and each contraction there's so many poles and there's a cut over here of the corresponding spectral curve. And you measure the number of the uh, things, the number of contractions over here. So, so you have these, uh, this Feynman diagram, this original Feynman diagram, but then you have a system of cuts, which is sort of the, uh, gives a graph, which is dual to the original graph because uh, transverse to every big contraction, you'll have another cut, which measures this, ju just like transverse to this set of big contractions, there is this cut. Uh, so that's what you have. And, uh, uh, and the, if you wish, the period of these cuts is the number of these big contractions. And uh, so, the, uh, uh, so, so if I consider the original Feynman diagrams corresponding to these covering maps, the dual diagram, in fact, has n faces because each with a pole, um, uh, the original vertices of my Feynman diagrams now become faces of the dual graph. So the dual graph has poles, uh, the zis, and it has 2n minus 4 vertices, which are the zeros, the cuts extend, remember, from the zeros of the um, uh, spectral curve. And, uh, and then uh, because it's a planar diagram, the number of edges is three and minus six. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so this graph, this dual graph uh, and the spectral curve, the spectral curve to leading order, or if you include the one over n, it's, it is a, a quadratic differential. And in fact, it is what is called in the maths literature, a Strebel quadratic differential. A Strebel differential is, a very is a very rather special differential that exists on any Riemann surface. So uh, uh, it has double pole. If I consider an n-punctured Riemann surface, it's the unique uh, meromorphic quadratic differential which has double poles at um, the uh, at the n-punctures, the zis in our case. Uh, and with real residues at each of these, which is what we have also, because the residues are essentially the alpha i square, the alpha i, which were the, you remember the wi rescaled. And then there are um, the most important defining property of a Strabel differential is that if you consider the square root of it, and so it's a single differential and you integrate it between any two zeros, uh, the integral, which in general would be complex, is actually turns out to be real. Uh, and in fact, by with an orientation positive. Uh, so these periods or these treble lengths are real. And that's a property of, uh, I, once I say that I have a differential which has double poles with real residues, and these integrals are real, there's a unique quadratic differential on uh, uh, for, uh, for a given Riemann surface. So that's the nice thing about a Strebel differential. And we recognize that our spectral curve is essentially such a Strebel differential because as I just mentioned, these integrals are real and moreover, the, the periods are proportional to, uh, so it's not in general, it could have been a complex period, but these parameters nu and mu are actually measuring the number of these uh, uh, big contractions, and this is some fraction. And in the large n limit, this will just become some arbitrary real numbers, I mean, between zero and one. Uh, so this, uh, so these, uh, this, this is indeed the Strebel differential. Now, the nice thing about the Strebel differential is that it gives you a way to parameterize moduli space. And in fact, it does this in a very nice physical way because 
uh, it, uh, you can think of this treble differential as foliating a Riemann surface into sort of what are called horizontal trajectories, which are essentially, um, uh, I mean, you can, there's a way to kind of look at level surfaces of this Riemann surface, uh, on this Riemann surface of this treble differential, uh, as such that the poles are kind of uh, uh, centers of disc-like regions. And uh, in each disc, there's a kind of closed horizontal trajectories of this uh, Riemann surface. And, um, and these different disks are separated by a graph, which is indeed the A's are the zeros of the treble differential. So these are the cuts. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the cuts are the ones that form, as we just discussed, the graph, which is dual to the uh, skeleton graph of the Feynman diagram. So this uh, streb, this uh, critical graph of the treble differential, which uh, very naturally appeared for us as the uh, set of cuts of the matrix model, uh, is the one which is dual to which we will identify as, uh, and we saw in our particular case was the dual to the Feynman diagram, and. The, the, but what is important for us is that they give a one-to-one -one parameterization of the modelized space. Like I said, uh, if I fix the residues uh, to be some real numbers, if the remaining, there are two n minus six independent real lengths, these treble lengths. These give you a real parameterization of the modelized space. You recall this is a n minus three complex dimensional space. And so these two n minus six real lengths give you a one-to-one -one parameterization of the modelized space. So because there's a unique treble differential uh, and, uh, uh, and so corresponding to each such Feynman diagram, there's a unique closed string surface you can associate uh, to, uh, because uh, there is a, uh, uh, and, uh, um, uh, the this which is the treble differential associated to that surface. So, uh, so recall the logic is that each covering map corresponds to a Feynman diagram. Each Feynman diagram you can associate a unique spectral curve uh, uh, with specified periods, and therefore for those uh, unique uh, for each of those Feynman diagrams you have a unique. Riemann surface. And indeed, this Riemann, moreover, this Riemann surface is actually the one that you get by sort of gluing the Feynman graphs. Uh, and I'll show a picture in the next slide, but uh, this was the picture I showed you earlier, how Rubin graphs get glued up into uh, these cylinders uh, that, uh, that are interacting. Uh, and um, uh, uh, but I just want, so th this is exactly the prescription uh, for this whole uh, free fields to ADS way of getting uh, Feynman, uh, the closed string surfaces from the uh, Feynman diagrams. Uh, there's one interesting uh, 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 thing here, which I should mention that Razamath uh, had actually, in fact, uh, in the case of Gaussian matrix models, made a very similar prescription that this uh, treble length should be identified with the sort of number of bit contractions. And here you see in the large n limit, uh, something like that again happens. Uh, he was talking about a simple Gaussian matrix model where there's no position dependence, but uh, uh, at least in this large n limit, something uh, like that happens here. And these treble lengths take continuous values. They're discrete in the, at any finite n, but as n goes to infinity, these can take uh, continuous values. And, uh, and so this is the picture of, uh, if you wish, how this is another way to view how the uh, ribbon graphs get closed up into a Riemann surface. If you, uh, this is a four point function. If you can visualize one point at infinity, three points here and multiple big contractions. By the way, I should say all these fancy diagrams that I have had were made by uh, Pranavesh and I wouldn't be able to do them, but he, uh, he uh, quite remarkably implemented these. Uh, so um, uh, so th this uh, ribbon diagrams, uh, these ribbon graphs uh, essentially correspond to these segments. You can think of these as getting glued up 
in this particular way and forming this uh, Riemann surface. And, uh, uh, and uh, and each of these quadrilaterals that you see, which corresponds to sort of a contraction here, is conformally equivalent to these, uh, these strips. So, uh, so each of the quadrilaterals here, this one with the point at infinity, this one, each of these are strips. And these strips are getting glued because these points are at infinity. These are the double poles, the ZIs, and they are at infinity. And, and these horizontal trajectories are essentially, uh, uh, these horizontal trajectories are essentially these level curves on the three month surface. So it, this, these ribbon graphs are essentially all getting glued up exactly as you would expect the two form the dual uh, Riemann surface. So, uh, so let me uh, just, I think I've gone uh, way over time, uh, Jewel. I hope I can get five minutes. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so, uh, so the, um, uh, uh, the sum over these different covering maps, which gives you a correlator, now goes over to an integral. Uh, so the sum, as I said, which was uh, uh, at any finite n, it's uh, finite, but now the periods and the large n limit, they go over to an integral and there's a flat measure, which gives you some integrand on moduli space. Uh, and what about the integrand? The integrand is the lunin mathur integrand because that's what the uh, each of these uh, sums over covering maps is weighted by this lunin mathur action. And the lunin mathur action is in terms of this Liouville field. And the Liouville field I related to the um, spectral curve or the log of uh, the covering, a uh, log of the derivative of the covering map. Uh, or more precisely, if you go to the subleading order, it's more nicely written in terms of the square root of the Schwarzschild of the covering map. And therefore, this lunin mathur action is actually nothing but the modulus of the Schwarzschild of the action, uh, Schwarzschild of the covering map. So you're weighting each of these by the co corresponding covering map, uh, e to the minus the Schwarzschild of the covering map, and you integrate over all the covering maps uh, that are allowed. And um, this is very similar to, in some ways, it is very analogous to that in ADS2, when uh, you have a softly broken conformal symmetry, the universal piece of the action is uh, the Schwarzschild now of the reparameterization from the boundary of the, uh, the boundary of the ADS2. Here, you're breaking conformal symmetry by inserting correlators, and you get uh, in, again in some uh, mild way, uh, with, and the covering map is capturing that. Uh, uh, covering map is capturing that uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, the, the correlators and the Schwarzschild of that covering map is what is weighting uh, each of these uh, configurations. There's a, yet another way to view them in terms of uh, the couple of other ways of viewing them. One is that this Liouville action can be also viewed as sort of a number go-to like action in terms of this so-called Strebel metric, which is another very natural metric again, which uh, mathematically comes out very naturally, but uh, it's in some ways a kind of an induced metric. And you see that when you write it in terms of the original, if you wish the uh, position X of Z, it's sort of like uh, this, uh, an action of uh, uh, what was called a rigid string. It's, you can think of it as something in terms of the extrinsic curvature of, uh, uh, the surface in an embedding space. And so in any case, but what we had shown in our earlier paper was that the lunin mathur covering, ma uh, the lunin mathur action here, this Liouville action arises uh, from the ADS3 sigma model. And in fact, this phi that appears here is the radial direction. This phi that appears here is the radial direction. And this lunin mathur action was the on-shell sigma model action for the correlator. So in some sense, this uh, that kind of closes that circle. And you see, starting from the uh, starting from the field theory correlator, you've sort of rewritten it as an integral or a stringy integral over moduli space. And each configuration, you're weighting it by the on-shell ADS3 sigma model action, which 
takes this very suggestive form, uh, which I think it would be very interesting to understand better why there is some this universal form that appears. So let me just close, I think, by saying that I think this is a test case where the whole program of uh, reassembling quantum field theories into string theories can be very explicitly carried out. Uh, we could close the circle uh, from, uh, in this particular case, uh, we could close the circle going from strings to fields as well, because there was a tractable world sheet theory. Uh, and, I, and therefore, I think this uh, gives psychologically, I think it tells you by giving this very explicit example, it tells you how exactly you can hope to generalize to large and quantum field theories in general. Uh, the general lessons from the world sheet theory, which we are exploring with Matthias and the underlying topological string and nature, which gives this localization and uh, the general lessons for field theories and higher dimensions as well including an underlying geometric picture of these Feynman diagrams. That's also something with various students at ICTS we are uh, looking at. In our paper, we actually gave a very long list of uh, problems and anyone who is interested, I invite you to, uh, to, to look at some of the um, uh, issues that uh, we uh, mentioned, uh, some of the questions that we mentioned over there. So thank you very much and sorry again for uh, going very much over time. No problem. So thank you very much, Rajesh. So maybe we can unmute our microphone and uh, clap up to show our appreciation. Uh, okay, so this is the time for questions. So if you have any question, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Uh, could I ask Rajesh? Uh, so, um, you, if I, if I understood right, you uh, these these um, you you want to identify your final um, answer uh, in one of your three one of your pictures with the uh, correlators of the of the op, of the vertex operators dual to these twist operators on the string well sheet integrated over the moduli space. Is is this right? Uh, even unintegrated, um, uh, th because this is the integral on the moduli space. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so we have, so each of these, I mean, I've just written it in three different forms. In some sense, this is like a space-time form involving the Schwarzschild. Um, this is more like a world sheet form involving uh, the number go to action and this is another way to write that in a sort of probably more like but essentially it's the same thing but they're all evaluated as integ these are each of these is an integrand because this uh, there's the modelized space the sum over covering maps goes over to uh, that gives a measure which is this integral and then you uh, uh, you have the there's a summoned here which is the e to the minus the will action and that will go here as well so you get uh, so this is so this is a kind of a kinematic part uh, of the this is just a measure piece of the modular space uh, that uh, is coming uh, from uh, from the sum over com covering maps but uh, the integrand the non trivial dynamical piece is uh, is this and th this should be identified then the integrand is the correlator of these of these of the vertex operators at, ar uh, at arbitrary cross issues. Yeah. And this is what we found in our previous paper that uh, any of these forms, uh, uh, because it, what we matched was to the Lunin Mathur. So we found that, in fact, the ADS3 Sigma model has the precisely uh, um, the, the correlators in the ADS3 Sigma model are given by a classical configuration, uh, in which evaluates on shell to the lunin mathur action in which you identify this phi with the radial direction of the ADS. Yeah. So this was something we found anyway in the Sigma model. Okay. Uh, and now it just, uh, yeah, yeah, we are just, uh, I mean, here we have just taken the lunin mathur action and, and written it in a more suggestive way in terms of uh, the, the thing, but ultimately it is the same correlator. 
I see. And uh, this 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 thing that you had found did did it work only for k equals one or arbitrary k? Yes, that was for k equal to one. I mean, at least our argument holds for k equal to one. Uh, mm -hmm. So this this sounds like very close to a derivation of. Uh, sorry, and what was the string vertex operator dual to these these boundary insertions? Those are the ones. I mean, uh, each there's a spectrally flowed sector. Uh, so the, the W hmm. label, the hmm. W twisted sector goes over to the so-called W spectrally flowed sector in the sigma model, and uh, uh, you know the Maldacena Ogori spectral flow the uh, is there, and then the ground state, the the, the lowest state in the uh, string spectrum in that spectrally flowed sector. So you that uh, corresponding uh, 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 vertex operator. So then, in the end, it sounds very close to a derivation of the statement that any any uh, any uh, symmetric product CFT maps to in spacetime to a k equals one um, ADS three uh, sigma model. Is, is this is this accurate? Uh, so this, I, I mean, uh, yeah, this sort of related to what uh, Amit was asking earlier. Also, I mean, the uh, I think in general there is a uh, the ADS three sigma models have. Uh, um, I mean, the symmetric orbifolds would have ADS three duals. There may be additional consistency conditions on the world sheet which we may have to. Uh, for the world sheet integrand, which may which may um, be things you have to, you see only uh, maybe at um, I, I don't know at loop level or by looking at the uh, excited states and so on. But uh, um, uh, because uh, 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 yeah, uh, so there may be additional consistency conditions that the integrand must obey because from the string world sheet point of view, I think what we have shown is only for the ads3 times s3 times okay it could be t4 or k3 or some maximally symmetric thing like that but uh, we use the ads3 times s3 piece as i was uh, trying to say earlier so uh, so from the string theory world, uh, world sheet point of view we have sort of seen that happening for these maximally symmetric ones from the mm, uh, uh, from the uh, point of view of the uh, symmetric orbifold CFT, we uh, we may see these conditions only if you you know have a uh, have specific uh, CFTs uh, because right now uh, by looking at this family of correlators you don't see the details of that CFT. Yeah, uh, you know you're looking at only the vacuum path integral only the central charge is playing a role and so on like uh, when uh, amit was asking that question i mentioned that just very little properties of the symmetric product uh, are coming but maybe when you consider correlators of excited um, 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 states there may be there'll be additional pieces to the integrand not just the lunin mother piece there'll be additional pieces so now you want to show that that whole thing satisfies all the axioms of a two-dimensional world sheet CFT correlator. That's not completely obvious to me how that will work. And probably for a general C equal to six year CFT, it will not in general be true. Uh, uh, so suppose uh, uh, I take uh, general uh, uh, superstring on ADS3 with Navesh-Balz background at any level, any internal space you wish, and restrict to uh, the sector of the theory, which amounts to state on the boundary of the continuum. And they concretely suppose that they have uh, the values of uh, the SL2 number J being minus uh, one half. Uh, if yes. you add momentum to it, it's minus one half plus IS right. some convention. Would this uh, sub sector of the theory will satisfy the things that you described today? Uh, I, I would think it's a little subtle in general because there's a if there's a continuum, it's very difficult to separate out the bottom from the rest. Uh, no, no, the momentum conservation. If if I restrict uh, the with uh, S equal to zero, then it closes on itself. Uh, but uh, but there will be this thing. I mean, it's true for simple correlators, but the full 
you know, the underlying consistency will uh, require you to add all the other states. And I say this also because if you look at the correlators of purely the j equal to half state, then the correlators have poles, whereas uh, the uh, for general k, uh, if you just look at the bottom of the continuum, uh, you just get uh, you get the correlators. The world sheet correlators have poles. This delta function behavior of the world sheet correlators comes because there is nothing else. So in some sense, the continuum smears out the delta function into poles. These are the poles that Maldusena and Oguri observed and so on in their correlators. And so I think they are very physical and that's why I feel you can't completely, de uh, you can't, I mean, the continuum is indeed there and uh, you remember, I'm sure the, the Liouville mode there doesn't decouple. So you, you get an extra piece from that. Um, uh, so it, it, it's not just the bottom of the correlator that really, uh, is uh, uh, is really contributing. Uh, so, so that's why I would hesitate to say that it's true for a subsector with k greater than one. There may be a way in which you can do it, but if I just look at the answers that people have for the correlators for k greater than one, they have poles. They have poles at these covering maps. These are exactly these places where x is gamma of z there, there are poles at those points, but here there are delta functions. That's the, that's the difference that you don't have uh, um, instead of these delta functions in, that, in those cases, there, it would go as some power law. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, interpretation of the continuous variables that parameterize MGN through uh, stable differentials, is that yeah. known for uh, large N expansions that come from gauge theories? Uh, like how much of that is like known only for the symmetric product ones and how much of it is known or expected more generally? Uh, so uh, your question is about the dictionary between the Strebel parameters and yeah. the gauge theory parameters? Yeah, so you had alluded to this as being like a refinement of the toothed picture, yeah. which is like purely topological and this adds more yeah. information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I think this picture is, uh, uh, is likely to be correct for uh, for the higher uh, for Yang Mills as well. Uh, that okay. uh, it will be the number of big contractions. Great. Okay. But in this large n limit, now even away from the, I didn't mention this, but if you go away from this large n limit, I think there are corrections. Uh, ah, okay. um, uh, so the Strebel lengths, while they will be discrete. They will not be proportional purely to the number of the weak contractions. They have, and that's I think something interesting, and we are trying to figure out in some special cases how that goes. But um, uh, so there, there's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, there, there's uh, the uh, there's the Strebel differential at finite n. The the relation to the gauge theory parameters. Will be a little more subtle. It'll there'll be a leading piece which will be like this, but there's likely to be additional corrections. I see. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Um, you 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 took this large n limit. Uh, in this large n limit, you got the continuous moduli space of the yeah. well sheet, the insertions yeah. of the well sheet string. But if you were at finite n, you would have just discrete stuff. Discrete, and that's what mapped with, I suppose, what you done done earlier. Earlier, yes. Yeah. So I I, I wanted to ask, uh, is this derivation going from field theory to uh, uh, to the string theory? Does that does that also work at finite n and give you the same discrete stuff stuff you had earlier? Yeah, I think it. Uh, at, in some ways, okay. So there are two points you can uh, two ways to say this. Uh, <clears throat> so Lunin, if you you uh, take the lunin mathur picture. So what we had done earlier was we worked at finite n, uh, and uh, uh, we saw that the world sheet correlator localized to precisely those delta functions, which uh, correspond to the lunin mathur contributions. So there were precisely as many contributions from the world sheet moduli space. 
as the lunin mathur contributions so you could you could say in uh, some sense that that because it's delta function contributions each of these delta function contributions con matches to one delta function contribution from the lunin mathur side so in some sense that matching was always there I think what is new here is telling how from the field theory how exactly the field theory I mean what is the dictionary that the field theory knows I mean how does the field theory exactly capture that moduli space so that's I think the uh, the uh, uh, it was sort of a more abstract description that, okay, every point in the moduli space that uh, uh, corresponds to a covering map, there's a corresponding lunin mathur contribution as well. Uh, but this is telling more, which in a way generalizes to a general field theory, because it's not uh, because the lunin mathur covering map picture perhaps may not generalize in any natural way, but, but this is telling you how the field theory Feynman diagrams are picking out precisely the points in the moduli space and which are the points in the moduli space it's picking out. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, uh, so I, I don't know if that distinction came across uh, very well, but it, it's a, in a way a more constructive way of uh, finding what are the model. I mean, uh, the it's a way of parameterizing the moduli space uh, especially in the continuum in terms of the field theory quantities, uh, that it is precisely these uh, uh, Strebel lengths that are associated with each Feynman diagram that corresponds to uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the field theory uh, that, the, that it's the Strebel parameters, it's the Strebel parameterization of moduli space that the field theory wants to sort of uh, give you. Is that effectively like establishing a particular map from a from a particular lunan mathur uh, winding and a point in the riemann surface moduli space yes uh, that uh, that indeed uh, yes but even that was there earlier in our earlier work i would say uh, but it is uh, saying that uh, uh, it's giving a more uh, it's a giving a picture of where the uh, i mean how to characterize the um, points on the moduli space that each uh, Feynman diagram gives you. Uh, so in some sense, we are taking it away from the covering map picture. Uh, the covering map is very is a very special picture, but, um, uh, but the Strebel parameterization is a very general picture. And, um, and so, so you're short, you're kind of short circuiting the covering map and making a direct identification between Feynman graphs with certain number of big contractions and corresponding point in the moduli space. I see. So this depended on this map, this map of this picture to a Feynman graph that you yes. talked about earlier. Yeah. And uh, that, that, that yeah. was, that was motivated. That was just a just thrown out or this was uh, this is a very natural picture in this particular case yeah uh, um, a natural Feynman diagram association to each covering map uh, which has all the properties of uh, okay. no one has uh, written down these Feynman diagrams in the usual way that you normally write down Feynman diagrams in terms of big contractions but um, but it is uh, definitely the analog of that. So you would hope that the same thing would work for n equals four young units. Yes, uh, because in a sense, the original prescription was for any, and there were, in fact, there was no reason for it to have even worked in this particular case, but it seems to show that there's a uniform way in which this works, not uh, for essentially by assigning for Feynman diagrams uh, this thing. And the same assignment, by the way, was the one that was working for the Gaussian matrix model. I didn't mention that, but I mean, I mentioned briefly about Razamat's prescription, but it was essentially the same things. In the Gaussian matrix model correlators, you had essentially the same sort of prescription working. And that gave you a map to a candidate topological string dual there. So, uh, so it's essentially the same. Uh, it's this, it seems to be a uniform thing, but 
yeah, you it gives you it uh, encourages you to think that it will be universal. Thanks a lot. Uh, hi, if I start with the background ADS three times S three times S three times S one at k equals one, well, exactly the things will go wrong because there I think I have still the continuum. Yeah, so uh, so the um, I, I think this is something uh, I haven't thought about very much, but my collaborator Matthias and so on have been. Uh, there is a point which is perhaps the analog of this, which is at k equals to two, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, um, so um, uh, uh, so this, uh, but I think no one has been pointed a place where this delta function like uh, localization will take place. Uh, so this is another reason why I was hesitating when Amit was asking these questions and so on, because I think there are, uh, I mean, what we have shown is for a very specific case from, from the world sheet perspective, we have shown for a very specific case and there we know it is a delta function localized. How much more general that delta function localization is, we still don't know. And in particular, the S3 cross S1 case that you mentioned is mm -hmm. perhaps the next one where there should be, where you should be able to see it. Uh, but the corresponding point is not quite k equals to one, but there, it might, then I think there's another candidate point, but, uh, but I don't think anyone has um, shown that uh, you get delta function correlators uh, localized correlators at that point. Uh, but that I think must be a, a necessary condition for there to be a dual CFT symmetric product CFT. Right, but, but, but if, I, if I approach the, uh, this problem from the field theory side, like I have assumed that there is a symmetric product or fold of S3 times S1, and then just uh, repeat the exercise that you just showed. So where exactly, I mean, I want to understand where exactly in this way, from, from the CFT going to the world sheet uh, theory, where yeah. exactly the uh, things will go wrong. Yeah, I understand that from the world sheet theory going to the field theory, maybe there are points where things will go wrong because this the delta function localization that you talked about. Yeah. But in the other direction that you just spoke today, yeah. where exactly things will go wrong. Yeah, so I, I, I uh, let me re say re-emphasize this. Uh, I, I was saying this a little while ago also, so what we are saying is that there's a very natural way in which you can get a candidate string integrand. Now, uh, we know that that string integrand it really comes from a proper world sheet theory in the case of the ADS three times S three times T four. In other cases, there may be additional consistency conditions that we may, I mean, uh, just because you get a nice integrand on the moduli space doesn't mean, I mean, that lunin mathur like integrand is a universal part of the answer, but uh, the consistency of the um, uh, integrand for being a uh, proper world sheet string background uh, will require, you know, the usual conditions of a two dimensional CFT co um, correlators that it should satisfy all the crossing symmetry, all the model invariance, all these uh, consistency conditions uh, for it to be a critical string theory. And that is something we have not explored at this level. Uh, so this, uh, so we are still not yet at the stage where we can say that we are reconstructing completely a consistent string background. Uh, we are saying that we can reconstruct, if there's a string background, we can reconstruct parts of it in this way. But you would have to now carry out a much bigger program of looking at the consistency conditions of all the field theory correlators and so on to be, uh, to be uh, confident that the dual string theory is a bona fide string theory. So in some sense, it's the first step towards uh, this thing. It's telling you how large and field theories can reassemble themselves into string theories, but it doesn't tell you it's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. I see, okay. Hmm. I have a small uh, question observation, Rajesh. Uh, so, uh, 
one starts with this uh, symmetric product uh, orbifold. So mm -hmm. in some sense, it is the, the permutation group is like a gauge group, basically. Yes. And uh, the linen mathur construction basically constructs a sort of a gauge invariant yes. T4, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now, of course, uh, this con this type of construction can be done for any any symmetric product conformal field theory. Yes. And uh, then again, the scattering equations will be very similar, right? The scattering equations will be very similar for uh, the covering maps. Yes, because yes. that's only uh, Th that's right. That's only determining the covering maps. That's right. Then uh, all you maybe require is that the uh, dimensions of these oper various operators of this arbitrary conformal field theory should scale within. They should just grow in, scale yeah, within that, in some that way. Is, uh, the, yeah, that will be also, I think, happening if we have uh, the, in the twisted sector, the dimensions will also scale within. Because I think the ground state twisted sector, the precise factors depend on the theory. But um, uh, but uh, uh, mm, uh, but I mean so this, this is uh, the, this sort of it may the exact factors here may uh, yeah, be different. But, uh, like, uh, you uh, have some something like alpha i times n, where yeah. alpha i are characterizing the conformal field theory. Right. So all this construction entirely is very independent of uh, yes. So that's exactly. And uh, then yes. you immediately get a matrix model, the Penner model. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's it's quite so universal this, in some sense. So this is insensitive, exactly. And yeah. that I think is its strength, that it's a very yeah, robust. Yes. Uh, that's but right. the, the, to answer the questions that I think Shiraz and Amit and others were asking, uh, yeah, it, so what this is telling us is that this sort of re organization of the sum over the covering maps as an integral. This is very general. This will happen. A and there is a robust runin mathur uh, sort of a contribution to the correlator. But this is only this is the only contribution for the ground state uh, um, operators. There will be the additional piece which will involve the path integral of the XI, of the actual CFT if we consider more general correlators. Yes, yes. Uh, so now the question is, OK, this part and this part are kind of universal to all symmetric orbifolds <clears throat> as integrands on the world sheet. But there may be additional pieces which will really know about the internal CFT. So the, the integrand will have this, this, and then there will be a CFT dependent piece. And now that CFT dependent piece will have to satisfy certain consistency requirements uh, for it to be a world sheet CFT. I mean, that, uh, for it to, uh, but I, again, I think, yeah. Uh, so I don't know how it will go, but uh, the, the, what uh, I don't want to say that every symmetric orbifold CFT will be a string theory, though I would love to say it, but I, I hesitate to say it because I, I think that there may be cons additional consistency requirements, but it may well be that the uh, if the space-time CFT satisfies certain uh, certain requirements, the uh, internal CFT here, the world sheet CFT that you reconstruct over here, will be essentially satisfying the same. Uh, uh, I mean, it will be a bona fide world sheet CFT, which is uh, uh, which is a well defined one. Uh, so. It may well be this, that it is more general than uh, just for T4 or K3 and so on. It's just that uh, what I know doesn't allow me to conclude that. But so, so Rajesh, one more quick quick follow up yeah. uh, just on what you said uh, just now. Uh, you you have these um, without the insertions, um, without yeah. extra excitations. On, uh, of your operators, just taking these ground state twisted sectors. Yeah. Um, you got, uh, you had a map between any particular Riemann, uh, Lunen Mathur map and a point in the moduli space on, on uh, of four insertions on S2. So you knew where your operators were on the S2. Now, suppose you, in addition, have some excitations. So that would, uh, that would be like the, the uh, branched cover S2 
with four excitations at particular points. Yeah, the, the same points. The these are the same points. I see. Yeah. So these are the same. I see. So so the map that you established was just the very natural one. It's just exactly that, that's true. That's universal. Yeah. Uh, because okay. in the in this picture, this is universal. This part is universal. What will change is that instead of having the identity operators at these points, which is what we would have when we lift this, we will now have some vertex operators of the seed CFT. Because uh, now you have a path integral of a single copy of the seed CFT. Supposing you replace T4 by whatever seed, you'll have a single copy on this covering space and whatever the excitations here, they will be, let's say, in some uh, untwisted sector of that uh, seed CFT. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, and you will have one of those excitations at each of these points. Uh, so instead of a vacuum path integral, it will be a path integral of uh, uh, of the C, uh, of the CFT with those excitations. With those so in a sense, you're almost, if you wish, if you identify this with the world sheet. You're almost there because you're saying, like, let's say even for T4, what are you saying? You're saying that now you have some, instead of the ground state, you have some T4 operators excited. So what is it uh, telling you? Or that it's telling you that the, now the integrand is not just that lunin mathur uh, Liouville factor, but you have a path integral, which gives you a correlator of the T4 theory on this world sheet. And that's precisely what the world sheet is. The world sheet, when you compute a world sheet correlator uh, with the T4, uh, there you have only one T4, right? It's ADS three times S three times T4. Mm -hmm. And you, when you do the world sheet with some torus excitation, you will do a computation precisely of this kind. You will precisely insert some vertex operators on the, of that torus uh, over here and do the path integral on the torus. So here's, in that sense, so, got, yeah. And here's really so, crucial, it's k equals one, right? Because you can't insert other excitations of the ADS three and the S3. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, it's just these winding modes. Yeah, uh, exactly. These are the only physical states in some sense. So, so can I say that what you said uh, means basically that you are now looking at some sort of a non-critical string theory? I mean, if yeah, you include I mean, all uh, the uh, yeah, I, I mean, other excitations. If, 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 uh, because the ADS three times S3 piece is topological, so nothing much happens there. And everything is all only happening in this symmetric or before uh, that seed part. So Rajesh, why haven't what you said amount to the statement that now if you don't look at these vacuums, you get the product of two four-point functions. One that you've computed and one that is just the four-point function of these operators. Yeah, it is that. So then why can't we just test whether it's consistent? I mean, does this satisfy the rules? No, no, uh, for the T4, it is obviously consistent. No, but for anything. But yeah, for anything, that's the thing. Yeah, um, what you said works for anything. Uh, I mean, this uh, the lunin mathur thing works for anything. Uh, so I could put here instead of T four, I could put S three cross S one, or I, I and, don't know, whatever. And you uh, could put an arbitrary excitation also. For... You could put arbitrary excitations, and for T four, it's I think that's how it will work. I mean, because it's that's essentially what the world sheet computation also is doing. So yeah. it's sort of. That's what we said in our previous paper, uh, that the world sheet, uh, the, that's why it's without loss of generality, you don't have to worry about those excitations that goes along for the right. But now if you have some other theory, uh, yes, it's the product with that theory. Now you have to ask whether, is that a consistent string background? Of course, C equal to six is one condition you need, but um, mm, right. Uh, is there anything more? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But first, you could ask whether it defines consistent CF uh, correlators well, for a, a conformal yeah. theory. And uh, that, uh, that would be very uh, fast. A consistent target space, right? Consistent. Right. Uh, uh, no, sorry, no, I mean, uh, on the well sheet. You've got some well sheet correlators you're identifying with these. Yeah. And you could ask are these, do these satisfy the axioms of correlation functions on a 2D well sheet? And the answer is almost certainly yes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Because it's essentially the path integral on of the uh, uh, it's two decoupled sectors, basically. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so then it's only these other things like central charge and like centers saying non critical, critical, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's the kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very interesting.
Any other questions? Yeah, Rajesh. Um, ah, so right. it's it's late, rather. So <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, so, <laughs> perhaps a, 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 a naive question. So there are some similarities with uh, uh, you know c equal to one or c less than one matrix models. Uh, in particular, uh, you know when you talk about the ribbons merging. Hmm. Uh, so you know, but there. Um, yeah, you needed a second uh, scaling. You know what I mean is that you, you have large n. In addition to that, there's a coupling constant in the matrix uh, polynomial. Mm -hmm. You have to tune to some critical value. Yeah. Which forces, which forces the following fact mm -hmm. that the number of weak contractions yeah. involved in computing partition yeah. function or correlations right. is automatically infinity. Right, right. So, and with that fact, in fact, also uh, ensured some universality of what polynomial you used. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, the scaling polynomials, I remember. So, um, so it didn't matter. So like you could take cubic, you could take quartic and so on and so forth, you get the same stuff. So this uh, somehow you were just taking large in. And uh, uh, what I mean to say is that what ensures that the number of weak contractions that would, that would dominate is uh, is large. Here it is just because the operators are large. It's like in free angles theory, uh, if I took trace phi to the two W and uh, correlators of that kind, and I took a very large W, there will be many, many, many weak contractions. In the, and so if I let all the W scale as some other parameter N, not the original gauge group N, but some other parameter N. Oh, okay, I see. And so it's like a BMN type limit. Mm, I see, got it, got it. So yeah. Mm, uh, so in some BMN type limit, you get this sort of, there, this, uh, this is a discrete delta function localization goes away. Mm. And you again get some kind of a, a continuous moduli space. Uh, um, I mean, the disc, uh, unlike in the c equal to one, c, uh, c equal to one or c less than one models, where you really needed to tune to the double scaling limit to get the continuum string theories, because you always have trace phi to the power four or trace phi cube. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh, only uh, I see. Mm, got it. Uh, yeah, uh, but here, uh, here the at the finite. Um, uh, I mean, uh, here, uh, if I just consider trace phi to the two w with finite w, then only a finite there are only a finite number of points on the modelized space that. This, in, in fact, this is why I feel uh, actually uh, I think that people needn't have taken the double scaling limit in the this thing. I think that even at finite, uh, without taking the double scaling limit, also there are consistent string backgrounds. Except they are probably more topological, and that's why they are not more familiar because you don't have uh, they 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 are they they will have this funny property that the correlators are delta function localized on modulized space, but correlators which are delta function localized on modulized space I think are perfectly fine. I mean they you don't need to I mean it's somehow we have this uh, picture that you know we need to have this whole modulized space and integral over the modulized space. And that's why there was this whole thing that you get this dense triangulation and it fill, uh, fills out the modulized. I don't think it's all necessary. I see. Interesting. It's just that it's more unfamiliar. Uh, there are I think there are consistent string backgrounds uh, uh, for finite. Just like over here, uh, the k equal to one theory in general at finite w's you get a consistent correlators. Hmm. Okay, great. I, uh, I would like to understand uh, uh, a bit more of this uh, later on. Yeah, thanks Rajesh. Sure. Any other questions? <laughs> I think yeah. it's- Yeah, I think it is getting long, yeah. So thank you everyone for this, uh, for joining this seminar and for the lively discussion. And thank you Rajesh uh, for the very nice seminar. Uh, so I wish you a very nice time and see you in next week. So have a very, have a very good time. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, bye-bye.